Good morning. Um, I'm Tony Irwin. Uh, I guess I was given a little bit of an intro earlier, but I'm going to, uh, I'm the lead architect for the Blue Mix UI, and I'm going to talk about our jour team's journey from Monolith um, to microservices um, during this half hour. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the origins of the Blue Mix UI. Um, we'll talk about some of the problems we had with our original monolithic um, implementation. Um, we'll talk about how microservices helped um, deal with some of these demons, I guess, and uh, then some new problems that occurred um, with, uh, with our microservice architecture. There was already some mention of added complexity and things when you go to microservices. Um, the Bluemix UI um, serves as the front end to Bluemix, which is IBM's open cloud offering, which uh, features Cloud Foundry as, as a big part of that. Um, it lets users um, create and manage um, Cloud Foundry resources, containers, virtual servers, um, accounts, billing usage, et cetera. Um, it runs on top of the Bluemix PaaS layer, which is Cloud Foundry. Um, it started as a single page application. Um, you know, it's the intent to provide a desktop-like uh, experience in the browser, so it's loading all HTML in one page, um, using JavaScript to manipulate the DOM and all that. Um, the, the stack was kind of the state of the art, at least in IBM. Um, we were using the Dojo framework on the front end, so you know, Dojo front end, single Java server back end, at least in IBM at the time, you know, three or four years ago was kind of the common stack. Um, but we kind of quickly figured out that it's not really where we wanted to go for um, the, our cloud uh, environment. Um, this is just you know a few random pages from the Bluemix UI. Um, so it's a fairly big um, application with a lot of different pages. And this is just a a very simple picture of of our original monolithic architecture. Um, basically at the top, the Bluemix UI, which is the, you know, the client in this case, which is the browser. Um, just some different components we had, like the home page and catalog and dashboard. Um, really just kind of showing all that logic was, at least the UI logic was pretty much loaded onto the front end. Um, the back end running in Cloud Foundry was the single um, Java server. Um, and then uh, we, uh, the, the monolith, the Java monolith would talk to the various backend APIs like Cloud Foundry, um, UAA, um, billing, authentication, et cetera. So, so this led to several problems. One was performance. Um, there's, Dojo is a very large um, JavaScript framework, so it was kind of loading this heavyweight JavaScript. Um, uh, kind of led to some bottlenecks. Um, since it was a single page application as well, there was really no data we included um, from the server in the initial payload, so it was all um, AJAX requests, um, which you know just, again, kind of bogged things down. Um, it's also difficult to integrate code from other teams, and this will be a theme um, as I get deeper into the, to the talk, but uh, we, we wanted to make a flexible framework, because you know, at IBM, you know, I've got my core team um, but there's, you know, like 20 other teams that want to also kind of be part of this uh, console framework and asking everyone to somehow write a Dojo plug-in to get into what was their monolithic app really wasn't practical. Um, well, you know, some of this, you know, if you, if, you, if you dealt with microservices, you already know, but uh, um, with a monolith, you know, when you have an update, you have to push the whole thing as opposed to being able to push a smaller part of the system, so that was an issue. Um, poor SEO, um, so search engine optimization was poor um, because, um, as I mentioned, the HTML uh, payload really didn't include any searchable data. And uh, <laughs> the last point there, uh, and I don't know how many people in the room have ever used Dojo, but uh, at, at the time, um, we had some new hires come in and they had wanted nothing to do with it, so. <laughs> Uh, rightfully so, wanted to move to a little bit more modern, uh, lighter weight infrastructure. So, so we decided to go to microservices, and these are some of the advantages or things we thought would help us uh, deal with some of the problems with our monolith. Um, 
you know, one, one issue we had is that we were a live production product. We wanted to totally re-architect it to microservices, um, but obviously that takes time, especially when you've got pressures to continue to add new function as well. Um, so we um, went down the path that we could slowly break this monolith down into microservices, kind of, um, you know, continue down this path of a lighter weight stack, um, but, but keeping, you know, the core monolith, monolithic aspect of the product alive as we broke things apart. Um, the, the, we tried to go for smaller services that were optimized for speed um, and page size. So we went with lighter um, UI frameworks, um, you know, and, and services that were focused on, you know, a smaller subset of things than the monolith as a whole. Um, microservices also help increase developer productivity. There's less chance of breaking other parts of the product because you can deploy um, individual microservices. Um, loosely coupled services uh, can deploy at their own schedule. Um, so, so, the, so I kind of alluded to this before that we have all these other teams that want to plug in. Um, they don't want to wait for one big push. They want to update as they have changes. Um, microservices, and, and this is a little bit fuzzy, <laughs> not really microservices that allowed us to improve our SEO, but just as part of this re-architecture, we, uh, you know, we started doing more server-side templating, um, including some more content in the page, um, in, in individual pages, rather than having one big uh, monolithic uh, single page app. Um, so this, you know, had more content than that Google uh, and other search engines could crawl. And uh, I'll get into this a little bit deeper shortly as well, but we wanted, uh, you know, as the core team worked and we had other teams plugging in, we wanted to make it look like it was all part of one product. Um, so we used some microservice composition so that we could all share some common UI elements and things like that. So th this, this diagram basically shows our, our, our uh, microservice pattern. Our typical UI microservice is going to be implemented this way. Um, again, uh, we have the Bluemix UI uh, client at the top, you know, where all the HTML, CSS, JavaScript is. Um, you know, the, the JavaScript may be um, vanilla, uh, could be Polymer, React, Angular. We've been uh, kind of focusing on React. Uh, more often than not within um, our product. Um, the, I, I always forget to talk about the proxy piece of this, um, the, pro the gray box there. Um, the proxy is really what makes the microservice system come together um, because as requests for a particular path come in, the proxy decides what microservice um, to send the request to. Um, so this um, Node.js microservice in the middle of the green box um, might, might be the catalog, our catalog microservice, for example. So when slash catalog comes in, um, the request is forwarded on um, to this microservice. Um, so um, as I alluded to, all of our new microservices are in Node.js. Um, we're using Dust.js for server-side uh, templating. Um, the, uh, a UI microservice needs to call our common header microservice, which um, this is what I was alluding to before. It, it provides an API uh, to get the, the header at the top of the page um, so that all pages can at least share that piece. And these microservices may also call other um, API microservices or, and certainly uh, the various backend APIs. Um, we're, we're also using uh, you know, Redis for shared session storage. So. So you authenticate, and then these UI microservices can grab tokens out of the session. And this is a, a visual uh, depiction of, of how we compose the pages. Um, so the green box is just a microservice. It has invoked common, and, and you see the strip at the top is basically what, what we call the header. Um, so with the server-side templating, um, the microservice can take that HTML snippet, uh, put it into the its overall HTML payload, and serve that. And then you've got a, a header with user information in it 
as well as whatever content the page uh, wants to provide. So uh, this, this whole process for us started a couple years ago, really. And we're, we feel like we're, and I'll show more, <laughs> kind of the stages of our uh, progression. Um, but uh, uh, we're pretty much where we want to be, still not, you know, quite, you never quite get <laughs> everything exactly the way you want it to be. But uh, um, so back in February of uh, 2015 was the first release um, we had that had any microservices at all. And as I mentioned before, we wanted to start, you know, kind of slowly. We started with uh, home and, and solutions were kind of two uh, smaller pieces of, of the monolith. We thought, well, let's just make those microservices to start with. Um, so you can kind of see, so those, those green boxes moved out of the top, became microservices on the back end. Um, the Java, um, the Bluemix UI server, which is our Java app, still running there. Um, we've got the proxy, which I mentioned, um, which is routing requests to the various apps as needed. It's all, de all deployed to Cloud Foundry. Um, th this, uh, I, I was at a conference in Shanghai a couple weeks ago, too, and uh, you know, it, it, that was more of an academic conference, so uh, folks are very interested in research around how you break a monolith down into microservices. And, uh, you know, my, my view is it's more of a black art uh, than a science at this point. Um, we, you know, we started with a couple smaller components and, and slowly, you know, things that seem to logically kind of go together. Um, you know, but, but some of the, the academics of the conference were like, well, is there a, uh, uh, could you assign a score <laughs> to your architecture and, you know, to rate how good it is? Um, no, no one had an answer to that at that conference. I, I think that's a very difficult thing. You know, beauty is in the, the eye of the beholder, I think, in, in some of these microservice uh, breakdowns. Um, so, that, you know, as you know, there's lots of different ways to uh, slice and dice. Um, phase two was about a year later. Um, and, you know, I'd say 90% of our mi migration was done at that time. Um, the account stuff was still kind of mostly on the, the client side. Um, you see a lot more green boxes um, as that UI logic moved down into separate microservices. Uh, our Java server is still there, but it's doing less and less. It's just, by this point, it's just serving some APIs um, that we hadn't yet ported to Node. And our end goal is, you know, to get rid of the Java server. We, we do technically still have it there. Um, we, we would like to, you know, just for team consistency to, to be all on Node.js. So that's something we still want to get rid of. But, but we're essentially at this point now, except for um, some remnants of the Java uh, server laying around. Um, I mentioned, uh, you know, plugins and other teams wanting to be able to, uh, you know, plug in, <laughs> be part of the console and deploy on their own schedule. Um, and th this diagram is, is intended to show that. So we talked about how the proxy routes requests to our individual microservices. Um, other teams, um, here the, the yellow boxes on the, I guess it's my left, or whatever. Um, uh, like, so we've got like Watson, um, IoT, OpenWhisk, various components um, that uh, other teams own. And, you know, it's so like slash Watson would route all requests to the Watson uh, endpoint that they've provided. Now that may be in, in a microservice on its own right or maybe a proxy to other microservices. Um, we, we really don't care. Um, we've, we've got about 25, I think, core microservices or so, and with all of our, you know, I think, I, I guess this slide says 15 teams, I think we, it's probably actually closer to 20 now, um, teams that have plugged in um, within IBM to this infrastructure. And, uh, you know, they, they all may have, you know, a handful of microservices. So, so if, you know, it's a very loosely coupled system, you know, maybe 100 microservices um, when you add up all of the, the teams involved. So when you move to microservices, 
uh, you know, I guess the saying is there's no free lunch, right? So there's always, um, you know, you tr sometimes you trade one set of problems for, for another. I mean, it, it has been a good move for us, um, but, you know, it does bring some added cost. Um, so there's uh, more moving parts. You know, I mentioned we have 25, 30 microservices plus all the plugins. So there's, you know, more moving parts, more complexity. Um, the build pipeline uh, becomes all the more important, you know, to be able to orchestrate deploying that many microservices. Um, federated status, monitoring, I'll t I have another slide that'll go into that in, in more detail. Um, but I think th this was something we really underestimated when we started, how important it is when you have microservices, you know, all these loosely coupled things, to be able to monitor, you know, a problem comes in at 2 a.m., how do you figure out what went wrong? Um, you know, or if you have a performance bottleneck, how do you figure out um, what, what component is causing that issue? So we, we've, we've invested a fair amount into um, monitoring, and we'll talk a little bit more about that briefly. Uh, uh, the granularity of microservices um, versus memory allocation. Um, so as I, I mentioned, uh, there's it's more art than science. I think when you're breaking down a monolith um, into microservices. Um, but when you're deploying, uh, you know, one consideration though, you, I've heard people coin the term nano services. We did not want to get to the point <laughs> where we've got, you know, a thousand different microservices, um, you know, so we've got more than 25 to 30. Um, but if you look at, like in Cloud Foundry, as you know, uh, you have to allocate uh, memory per instance up front. Um, so we did notice a significant uh, increase in, in memory usage um, by doing this. So, so our Java app, our single Java app was, you know, three instances at two gigabytes a piece. So we were using roughly six gigabytes um, allocated to those um, Java instances. Um, with our microservice system, you know, this, this was some math I did when we had like 27 apps, um, you know, about 95 instances. Um, even if those are, you know, 512 to a gigabyte apiece, you know, that, that, that adds up to, you know, 55 and a half gigabytes. So that's, you know, far more uh, memory um, than, than the monolith took. Um, there were some issues just trying to, we, we, as I mentioned, we needed to keep that monolith running. Um, so we had some issues just you know, trying to have some seamless navigation between the single page app and the individual pages. Um, uh, Blue-green deployments, there's, um, you know, doing a blue-green deployment in Cloud Foundry is easy. You know, with one app, uh, when you have 30, what do you do? Um, we ended up doing a blue-green deployment at the proxy layer. Um, so we'd deploy, you know, one set of 30 microservices and another set, and we would do blue-green at the proxy layer. Um, promoting uniformity and consistency, that this is, you know, if, if something keeps me up at night, sometimes this is it at IBM. You know, we want, you know, these individual teams to be able to plug in and have freedom to deploy on own schedules and everything. Um, but if you want to try to have a product that with a consistent UI experience, um, you know, what, what sort of policing do you put in place and quality standards? Uh, when you've got other teams uh, plugging in. I, I'm not sure we've <laughs> totally nailed that one down yet, but that is a, a concern in our case. Um, and geo load balancing and failover, um, not really uh, required to do microservices, but you know, we, we had invested all the time, and I have another slide dedicated to this shortly, but we had you know, invested all the time in trying to get HA and resiliency for our microservice system, but you know, then if you're running in just one data center, that data center goes down. There's not much you can do. So, so we did uh, uh, undertake some efforts to be able to load balance between different uh, Cloud Foundry deployments. Um, so I mentioned monitoring. Um, just a little bit more detail here. Um, lots of things can go wrong when you've got this many microservices. And, you know, they're all talking to various backend APIs that can have problems. Um, Cloud Foundry can have problems, there can be networking issues, you know, how do you figure out what's wrong? Um, so we did build uh, a monitoring system. Um, 
you know, some needed metrics or metrics that have helped us along the way. Um, so, so for all of our microservices, we have all inbound and outbound um, HTTP requests, so with response times and error codes. And we've got, um, we all, we pop it into Grafana. It's a little uh, example Grafana chart at the bottom. And, uh, you know, when you start seeing various components returning a bunch of 500 errors, just as an, exa as an example, you know, you might see a big uh, bump in uh, red. Red would indicate 500 errors here. There's not a lot of red here, but if, if you see a big red bump, um, you know, there's probably a problem. Um, we also cared about memory usage and CPU usage and uptime for every microservice. So, you know, we keep track of app crashes, all those kinds of things. So if your app is crashing, um, your quality of service is probably going to be impacted. Um, you know, general health of, of ourselves and our dependencies. Um, as I mentioned before, for, as an example, we've, we use Redis for shared session storage. Um, so we do want to, so one of the things we do is keep track of how healthy our Redis system is. Um, you know, if that starts to have issues, that's something we need to resolve quickly. And aside from kind of the real uh, monitoring of, of real data, we do also run um, some site speed um, I.O. We use site speed I.O. To, to generate some synthetic page loads so we can look at uh, front end performance as well. Um, th this slide, um, I, I alluded to the global console that we have before, um, or that we just recently released. Um, we used to have, so we deploy in four, we have four public uh, Cloud Foundry deployments in, uh, at IBM as part of Bluemix. So Dallas, London, Sydney, and uh, Frankfurt. Um, we used to have individual URLs for each of those regions. These are very separate deployments. Um, we, with the global um, console, as we called it, we have one URL now, consolebluemix.net. Um, we do have a region selector, so if you wanted to create Cloud Foundry apps in Frankfurt or, or Sydney, we still have a switcher for that. Um, but instead of doing a whole page reload with a new URL, it's more of a filter in place. Um, so we use, you know, I haven't really talked about Akamai, but, but Akamai, we use Akamai here in our picture. Um, but the important part for load balancing is that it does a DNS lookup against a Dyne um, load balancer, which basically has all of the IP addresses of our different uh, uh, Cloud Foundry deployments. And so it's going to return uh, the one, the IP address for the deployment that is closest to you geographically. Um, so if I'm in uh, Sydney, hopefully I would get the UI served from the Sydney data center rather than the US data center. So that, that's an improvement in performance um, right there. Um, but the other thing is it looks for, uh, it returns the nearest healthy data center. Um, so if uh, <laughs> Sydney, you know, you're in Sydney, you would normally go to the Sydney data center if that data center goes down, you would be routed to the next closest one, which may be, you know, Frankfurt, say. Um, so you you don't notice any interruption in service, um, and we can go figure out what's wrong in Austin, or in not Austin, um, Australia. Um, yeah, and, and that's basically that. So the odds of all of four regions being down at once are pretty rare um, compared, certainly, to one one region being down. And that kind of brings us to the end. Any, I think we've got time for questions. Yep. Uh, yeah, there's two. <laughs> That's a good question. I, I don't know that we've been, uh, uh, I think we probably have built up some technical debt in terms of some dead code, you know, being in, in the Java piece. Um, I, I think in some cases, as we sort of ported things, um, we were probably better about <laughs> deleting that code. 
um, than than other times. Um, so this is going to be a you know we we do have a goal as I mentioned to knock out that Java server eventually. So I think we will have a little bit of a <laughs> of a challenge just to you know we'll be able to see what 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 API calls we make into it. So we'll know um, you know what's still being used, um, but. Um, as you're in sort of a porting exercise, there'll be pieces of Java code that we don't want to port at this point because they're not, they've either already been ported or no longer used. So um, I don't know if that answers your, your question. But. Yeah, it's. <laughs> uh, the proxy that you mentioned, what does that exactly do? Uh, over just routing to a certain URL in your internal? Uh, really nothing else. We, we tried to keep that layer very, uh, it's actually a Node.js app in Cloud Foundry. We, we, we probably will be moving to, to Nginx, but there's really no intelligence other than looking at the, uh, the host or the path and, and routing to the, to the right microservice. So, so why, why don't you use the routing option in Cloud Foundry, the, the default? Well, I think we started this before that was even an option. <laughs> uh, so it's probably one of the big reasons. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've, I've heard arguments that UIs need to be monoliths because you want to guarantee a seamless user experience between the different UI components. How did your UI design process change as you split up your UI into really separate microservices? I don't think our, you, you, from a user experience design perspective, I don't think it changed a whole lot. I mean, we do have more times where you click on a button and you get a full page reload as opposed to just, you know, some, some DOM updates occurring. Um, but I don't think that really impacted um, our design approach that much. Now it does, you know, there, there are cases where, um, you know, the UI designers will, uh, I, I guess you know propose something that doesn't necessarily fit real well <laughs> with our you know with just how our code is broken up. Um, uh, so that that can be a challenge. But but I, I guess I've typically thought well, if, you know let's uh, let's not make it an architectural decision that we had made at one point impact our user experience too much. So if there's some swizzling we need to do or extension points or whatever to make some of those things happen, um, then I then we need to be open to that. Uh, you, men you mentioned that um, you do blue-green deployments via the proxy, so you are deploying all of your microservices blue-green, even if you only change one, right? That, that's right. That's very uh, very astute observation. So that is, <laughs> um, we, we, we're, we've taken some steps to improve that. So we we do have the ability um, to swap in individual microservices, but um, it's not as good as it could be. Yeah. yeah so that's a, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. that, that, that's a shortcoming we have because yeah we we uh, uh, I think we've gotten smarter about. Uh, at least being able to update the proxy config of our on deck deployment to point at a new new version of a microservice, and the, mm -hmm. so we may still be doing a blue green deployment at the proxy, but we haven't actually deployed all new apps to do that. Okay. How, how many times do you deploy? How many times? Yeah. Uh, we're yeah. I, I wouldn't say we're. You know, I know some people like to deploy multiple times a day. We're we're more maybe you know, a couple times a week. Um, typically, um, I guess there's a few reasons for that. One is that just when you're making UI updates, you usually do need some. You know, we have automated tests and stuff, but sometimes you still kind of need that visual inspection to make sure nothing looks too askew. So there is there is some testing overhead and stuff when you're doing UIs. Thank you. Yep. The room goes Hi. way back there. Yeah, I can barely I see, see you. <laughs> yep. Hi there. So um, obviously individual teams will have responsibility for testing their own microservices. But in terms of the product as a whole, where does that responsibility lie and what sort of challenges would you have experienced? I, I'm sorry, I heard test in test terms of testing? Yeah, in terms of testing the whole product as a whole, um, I mean, individual teams will have responsibility for their own pieces. But who owns the, the overall piece? 
Right. Yeah. And that, that's a real challenge. I mean, so, so I mentioned that we have automated tests. So each microservice owner um, is certainly responsible for having a nice automated set of unit tests. Um, it, it's, it's a little bit more challenging when you then want to make test end-to-end -end flows. And uh, we, we do have some automated testing around that, you know, testing the, you know, if you transition from one UI, a page would, you know, serve from one microservice transitioning to another. I mean, we, we do have some tests around that, um, but that's, those are typically stored, you know, separately uh, from the microservices. And I, th I think we still need to do a better job there. We have a, a, a couple QA folks that, uh, um, would, would love it if we <laughs> required a little bit less manual uh, testing than we do today. Hey, uh, my question was, you compared the Java memory footprint uh, and the microservices footprint. Is that around the same functionality included in these two types, or was there also functionality-wise a difference? Um, no, the functionality was, I, I, I mean, we probably added some new function, but but by and large, it was, uh, you know, equivalent functionality. Okay, thanks. You're getting a workout. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, uh, you showed the different uh, data centers of the uh, installation. How did you manage uh, to synchronize the state between, uh, between the data and the data centers? That, that's a very good question. So, so our UI code doesn't really store a lot of state. Um, the, uh, you know, we, we really rely on back-end APIs. So just as an example, you know, the UI will allow you to create a Cloud Foundry application. That state is maintained in the Cloud Foundry, um, you know, by the API controller, right, and all of its back-end. Um, the, the one thing we do store is, like, the, the user token. Um, in the in the Redis session, so if we do do a failover, um, we do have to do a quick refresh of. We've got some cookies and things, so we can do a quick refresh of the token, and we end up because our Redis deployments are separate. Um, so oh, okay. So, so when you Redis is uh, Redis is used for that in the backend. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Yep. So we so we don't necessarily copy everything from a Redis here to a Redis there, but but since we don't store very much in there to start with. You know, we just get the new token and put it in the Redis when the failover occurs. So. Thanks. Um, monolith, um, yeah, they tend to have an exciting internal structure as well, right? There might be some layering going on and stuff like that. So in your case, um, the decomposition, did it just fall into clean uh, top to bottom slices, or was there also some sort of downstream services happening? And if so, how did you, how did you cope with that? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. They, I mean, I think it, you know, because you know, I showed the screenshot earlier of the different kind of sections of our UI, um, and typically the APIs and things provided by our, so our monolith didn't really provide a whole lot of UI. It just it kind of served uh, you know, all the JavaScript and HTML. Um, and you know we had to make backend API calls, um, so so the Java server ended up becoming just an API server. Now some of the the APIs tended to be kind of uh, you know so an API for Cloud Foundry, you know that was doing some Cloud Foundry manipulation like for creating apps was probably only used by our catalog microservice. Um, so we so we did sort of look at the various pieces of the UI. Um, catalog, dashboard, accounts, and billing, and, and those were roughly, you know, some of the pieces in our in our monolithic code as, as well. Um, so I guess you know that, that was somewhat natural. Um, I can't say we went and looked at the uh, you know the class hierarchy of our Java app and and used that to sort of drive um, you know the microservices we broke down. They, they were probably bigger um, components than. Uh, than uh, you know, individual you know, Java classes and things like that. I don't know if that answers the question, but. Then thanks, Tony. Uh, okay. Good talk. Um, good questions. And we ran out of time, so okay. we have to switch over to the next one. All right, thank you.